focus on headline. And let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. And for this, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters in Chang'ana and uh, Kim Soo-yeon. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. Good evening to you guys. We're going to start things off with the uh, news that we've covered uh, all throughout this week. Uh, President Yoon, uh, of course, on his uh, three-nation Central Asia tour, uh, starting off in Turkmenistan and then going over to Kazakhstan. He was in Uzbekistan. We're going to start things off with the summit uh, being held uh, between President Yoon sung yeol and uh, Uzbek President Shavkat Mirziyoyev in Tashkent, uh, the capital of Uzbekistan. And uh, these uh, stories are just coming out about an hour before the program, uh, mm -hmm. when I believe uh, the summit just concluded. Uh, give us the latest on this. Sure. Now, during his state visit, a total of 17 contracts, memorandums of understanding and letters of intent, including the 42 high-speed train supply contract, which is worth $270 billion one were signed in the presence of both presidents. No notably, Uzbekistan is the most populous country among the five Central Asian nations, with a population of 35.97 million. And over 50% of its population is under the age of 30, indicating significant potential for economic growth. Now, President Yoon also attended the Korea-Uzbekistan Business Forum to deliver a keynote speech and visited the Uzbekistan Startup Promotion Center which was established last year with the support of the Korean government. Now, of course, uh, for all of our listeners out there, we talked about all the different MOUs and uh, agreements that were in place. And this uh, high-speed uh, high train deal is a pretty big one because this is the actual contract that was signed. Uh, previously, there was a number of uh, a memor of a memorandum of understandings, which legally isn't binding. And we're kind of hoping for uh, actual deals in place. And this is one of them. Uh, President Yoon and his Uzbek counterpart uh, on Thursday, and uh, talk, held talks also in boosting bilateral economic ties. At a dinner meeting with the compatriots held at the hotel in Tashkent, uh, you have President Yoon saying that ethnic Koreans uh, there are making significant contributions in various fields, uh, fostering the friendship between South Korea and Uzbekistan. Uh, so, let's get more on this. Sure. So, acknowledging the 170,000 ethnic Koreans living in Uzbekistan, President Yoon described Uzbekistan as a brother nation noting that it is the only country in the region with a special strategic partnership with Korea. And President Yoon expressed his hope that the two sides will create a 21st century Silk Road um, through broader cooperation as core partners in Seoul's new K-Silk Road initiative, which aims to strengthen cooperation with the Central Asian countries. And he also mentioned that in his uh, summit with Uzbek President uh, Shapkid Mirziyoyev, they will discuss ways to enhance South Korea's special strategic partnership with Uzbekistan. And he noted that so far, Korea-Uzbekistan relations have made remarkable progress and centered around um, the energy and infrastructure fields. And today, cooperation is expanding to more diverse fields such as healthcare, climate change, education, education and public administration. And he also pledged greater interest and support uh, for uh, the overseas Koreans uh, the going forward. Yeah, uh, we mentioned how there is a large number of uh, ethnic Koreans uh, who reside in both Kazakhstan and uh, Uzbekistan. These are the two countries, the second and third stops and uh, President Yoon's uh, three nation Central Asian uh, tours. And uh, there, uh, and I, I learned this for the very first time, Koryo uh, Saram. That's mm -hmm. actually become a term, right? If you look it up, it's just kind of they just use the Korean term Korea Saram. Uh, one of the things that I've also realized is that there is a lot of people to people exchange between uh, Kazakhstan, South Korea, Uzbekistan, Kaz uh, and uh, South Korea because uh, there's a university, I believe, here in South Korea where it's catered to international students exclusively. And something like 80% of the students uh, in that particular international uh, studies uh, department 
are from Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And uh, there's always been a lot of uh, foreign exchange students coming to South Korea from those two countries as well. Um, also, during his state visit to Uzbekistan, uh, President Yoon urging the Uzbek youth on mm -hmm. Thursday, uh, saying uh, the future of both countries depend on you. We always say this, right? Mm -hmm. Children are the future. Well, the youth are the future as well, and also called on uh, the Uzbek youth to come visit South Korea. Hang on, let's get more on this. Sure. Now, speaking at the dialogue with the innovative future generation in Tashkent, President Yoon stated that our government will actively support the youth in Uzbekistan if they come to Korea to visit, uh, to study, or start a business. Now, President Yoon emphasized that it is the government's inherent duty to support the growth of businesses and added that we need to help young people continuously start businesses and not be afraid of failure. He further remarked that innovation is quickly responding to people's taste and preferences to make money, highlighting the importance of youth entrepreneurship. And he also said that in today's world, young people lead change and young people shape the tastes and preferences of the public, making youth entrepreneurship that much more important. President Yoon noted that Central Asia is emerging as a very important region, both geopolitically and geoeconomically, and stated that the Republic of Korea is striving to strengthen strategic partnership with this region's countries, including Uzbekistan. He further stressed that the most important aspect of a strategic partnership is human exchange, specifically pointing out that the exchange of young talent is what makes strategic partnerships sustainable. He concluded by saying that I am convinced that supporting and helping young people regardless of nationality through international solidarity is crucial for world peace and prosperity. Let's uh, move on here. Uh, senior officials of South Korea and the United States holding an emergency phone call regarding the speculated, highly speculated visit by Russian President Vladimir Putin to North Korea. Uh, we had some diplomatic experts saying that the visit may happen uh, sometime around uh, June 18th or the 19th are the two dates that were given. That's next Tuesday and next Wednesday. Uh, we had uh, the statement coming out from the Foreign Ministry here in Seoul. So, let's get more on this. Sure. So, on Wednesday, Wednesday, a senior official at uh, Seoul's uh, presidential office said that Putin is expected to visit North Korea in the coming days. And regarding this, South Korea's Vice Foreign Minister Kim Hong-gyun had a phone call with U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Kurt Campbell. And according to the Korean Foreign Ministry, Kim highlighted that Putin's visit should not result in deeper military cooperation between Pyongyang and Moscow in violation of U.N. Security Council resolution. And echoing Kim's concerns, Campbell pledged continued cooperation to address a potential regional instability and challenges opposed by this visit. And they agreed to closely monitor relevant developments and respond uh, decisively to North Korea's provocations and escalating tensions in the region uh, through close coordination. And meanwhile, uh, the Russia's uh, the Veromosky newspaper reported on Monday that Putin would visit North Korea and Vietnam in the coming weeks. And on Thursday, the Kremlin stated uh, that the Russia's right to develop closer ties with North Korea should not be in doubt or a source of fear for anyone and decline to name a date or agenda for a possible visit. Yeah, and that's the weird thing, right? Uh, normally when you have like these major state visits, uh, visits by the country's leader, you have an announcement from the country's foreign ministry, but the Kremlin hasn't made any announcement whatsoever on when this, this is going to happen. We're only getting speculation. In fact, we're Looking at, uh, what is it, uh, Planet Labs, that's the, the, the U.S. satellite uh, imagery uh, company. We're looking at s satellite imagery of uh, movements happening in Pyongyang right now to make speculations on when Putin is going to make these visits because apparently uh, there's been some like structures being built near the Kim Il-sung uh, Square in, uh, in Pyongyang and they're saying that usually when there's like high officials from either China or Russia that visit, they set these up. They're looking at the medium airfield to see if there's any kind of activity there to showcase that there's going to be some sort of military parade and the consensus right now is that if president putin does visit north korea and it's highly likely again that he's going to be visiting sometime next week that there's going to be some sort of massive event uh, that's going to be showcased and north korea wants to stress the fact that there is this close cooperation with moscow now given the fact that i think ties with china has 
gone a little bit south uh, over the years, uh, with China trying not to be further isolated from the international community. Russia, they have nothing to lose right now. And uh, so far, it's Russia, North Korea. But again, a lot of a great deal of emphasis. Cooperation is all great, but uh, at least uh, keep it in line with the UN Security Council resolutions is what both Seoul and Washington has been uh, emphasizing. Uh, we briefly mentioned this a few weeks ago, uh, the very first multi-domain military exercise uh, involving South Korea. Korea, the United States, and Japan. This is dubbed Freedom Edge. Uh, they took uh, the names of two joint drills uh, conducted between South Korea and the U.S. and the U.S. and Japan. Uh, this is expected to happen sometime at the end of this month, is mm -hmm. the reports that we're getting out right now. Uh, mm -hmm. The joint exercise comes amid a strong warning message from the three countries uh, with the expectations that uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin is going to be visiting uh, North Korea, as we mentioned earlier. And uh, the ever so growing uh, military cooperation between uh, Pyongyang and Moscow. So, Hannah, let's get the latest updates on this. Sure. Now, according to the military on Friday, South Korea, the U.S., and Japan are planning a multi-domain military exercise involving the U.S. Navy aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt. Now, the three countries are reportedly coordinating the specific timing, scale, and details of the exercise. And it is being concerned that the USS Theodore Roosevelt will enter Busan and then conduct training in international waters around the Korean Peninsula. And if realized, this will be the first deployment near the Korean Peninsula in two months since the South Korea-U.S.-Japan maritime exercise held south of Jeju in April. Now, the plan for the Freedom Edge multi-domain exercise was first disclosed during the Trilateral Defense Minister's meeting at the 21st Asia Security Summit, or Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore, earlier this month. Now, this regular exercise conducted across multiple domains, such as maritime, underwater, air, and cyber, aligns with the modern warfare trend of operations spanning multiple domains beyond traditional land, sea, and air. And the U.S. military conceived this concept in 2018. Now, the name Freedom Edge combines the South Korea-U.S. joint exercise Freedom Shield and the U.S.-Japan joint exercise Keen Edge, symbolizing the advancement of military cooperation among South Korea, the U.S., and Japan based based on their respective alliances. And until now, South Korea, the U.S., and Japan have conducted one-off trilateral military exercises, such as search and rescue ex exercises, mil uh, missile warning exercises, and strategic bomber escort drills. But this exercise regularizes and expands these activities. Previously, the leaders of the three countries agreed at the Camp David summit in August last year to systematically conduct multi-domain exercises to strengthen trilateral security cooperation. And at the Shangri-La dialogue this year, prior to the trilateral defense ministers meeting, uh, South Korea and Japan held a bilateral defense ministers meeting and agreed on measures to prevent the recurrence of patrol plane conflicts, laying the foundation for strengthened military cooperation between the two countries. The timing of the Freedom Edge is quite interesting because when we talked about uh, initially the Freedom Edge, uh, the trilateral multi-domain military exercise happening for the very first time this year, they didn't give a specific date. And even uh, today, when again, this is according to the military sources, there is no specific date. Uh, it's just speculated that it's probably mm -hmm. going to happen sometime at the end of this month. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they were saying that it was going to be sometime in the summer. That was the general consensus. But they are timing this. Uh, they're, they're trying to see when Putin is going to indeed visit North Korea. And considering the fact that uh, the, some of the military sources from both in Seoul and Washington have been saying that this meeting between Putin and uh, Kim Jong-un is actually going to further solidify the mo military cooperation between Pyongyang and Moscow, that the three countries are now going to do some sort of, uh, I guess, a military drill in response to this. And this is exactly it. The, the, the freedom keen is what we're looking at here. And so we'll have to see. Uh, this is definitely going to be met with some kind of response, uh, not only from uh, North Korea, but I think from China as well. And so we'll see when this actually does happen. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to stick with more defense stories here. Defense Minister Shin Wan Shik, uh, he's set to visit Romania and Poland next week for bilateral discussions on defense and arms cooperation. 
Federation. Uh, and uh, this is also amid a Seoul's push to clinch more arms export. Poland has been very keen on a lot of the South Korean-made weapons. Uh, so, yeah, let's get more on this. Sure. So, for the first leg of his uh, trip, Defense Minister Shin will visit Romania from Monday through Wednesday for talks with his Romanian counterpart, Angel Antivar, on expanding defense and arms cooperation, according to his office. And Shin is also scheduled to pay a courtesy call on Romanian Prime Minister Ion Marcel Ciolacu. And on Wednesday, Shin will leave for a three-day visit to Poland, where he is scheduled to co-chair a joint ministerial committee meeting on bilateral defense and arms industry cooperation. And South Korea and Poland held the inaugural session of the regular consultative body in Seoul in June last year, uh, following a rollout ceremony for the first FA-50 light combat aircraft uh, exported to Poland, which is seen as a, as a symbolic display of their growing cooperation in the arms industry. And Shin's trip comes as South Korea has been pushing to boost arms exports with his Romanian visit, expected to touch on South Korean arms the East European country has shown interest in, such as KF self-propelled uh, howitzer, Redback infantry fighting vehicles, and K2 tank. And during his visit to Poland, Shin is expected to highlight the South Korean government's strong commitment to securing additional contracts uh, following the initial uh, 12.3 billion US dollars defense export agreement uh, signed back in 2022. Yeah, and th this is good signs because uh, we did have some news a couple of months or a month ago or a couple of months ago, actually uh, throughout the, the first half of this year uh, with the Polish parliament uh, kind of being flipped with uh, the other party. Uh, there were some saying that they might actually cancel all the export uh, or in this case, Poland's case, imports of uh, foreign made weapons and uh, vehicles, military vehicles, uh, citing I guess, uh, you know, the budget issue and things like that. We can't be purchasing overseas foreign weapons. It costs too much, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, the, the reason why a lot of people are keen on purchasing uh, South Korean made weapons and uh, military vehicles is it's a lot cheaper than, let's say, U.S. made uh, ones or like uh, German made ones. And but it's, it's I wouldn't say equally as good, but it's almost as good. And uh, it's good for you. Bang for your bucks, basically, is what it is. Uh, let's move on here and talk about the nation's economy. Uh, we did talk about some highs and lows of the South Korean economy. We had the uh, the foreign minister, sorry, the finance ministry earlier today releasing its uh, green book. There, they said they are signs of mm -hmm. domestic demand recovery for the second consecutive month. Uh, they also issued some other data mm -hmm. uh, on the economy. Hannah, let's get more on this. Sure. Now, as you've mentioned, uh, SJ, in the June edition of the recent economic trends, aka the Green Book, released on Friday today, the Ministry of Economy and Finance stated that recently our economy is showing signs of domestic demand, recovery amid slowing inflation with improvements in manufacturing and exports, an increase that inbound tourist and improvements in the service industry, and noted that the trend of economic recovery is gradually expanding. Now, the government began mentioning signs of domestic demand recovery last month, and previously the government observed a difference in the pace of recovery between economic sectors, noting that domestic demand was not keeping up with the recovery in exports. However, it now sees that domestic demand is gradually improving. And according to the preliminary figures for the gross domestic product GDP, private uh, consumption in the first quarter from uh, January to March increased by 0.7% compared to the previous quarter and by 1% compared to the same quarter last year. And in April, retail sales decreased by 1.2% compared to the previous month, mainly due to durable goods. But production in the service sector increased by 0.3% with growth in wholesale and retail. And the government anticipates that factors such as the increase in credit card spending, the number of inbound tourist online sales, and high Highway traffic volumes in May will positively influence consumption. Conversely, the decline in the Consumer Sentiment Index, a decrease in domestic sales of Korean passenger car 
cars and a drop in the small business sentiment are considered negative factors. Yeah, the month of May here in South Korea is considered uh, family month, mm-hmm. and uh, you have Children's Day, Parents' Day, uh, Teachers' Day. Uh, the teacher is not really family, but still. <laughs> uh, and so there's a lot of spending going on. In fact, my credit card bill for the month of May was just ridiculous. Same and I think it's, I don't think it's just me, but it's just like everyone mm-hmm. around. So we are seeing, I don't know if this means there is a increase in uh, domestic demand or domestic spending. It's just for that month, right? We just tend to use a lot of money uh, for the month of May. Uh, the finance ministry also expects the manufacturing and export uh, to continue to perform well too. Mm-hmm, that is correct. Now, exports have been increasing for eight consecutive months since last October. And in April, industrial production increased by 2.2%. 2% compared to the previous month, with a decrease in mining and utilities offset by growth in manufacturing. And consumer prices last month rose by 2.7% compared to the same month last year, maintaining a 2% range increase for two consecutive months. And the increase was narrower than the previous month on 2.9%. While prices for some items like fruits continued to soar and the increase in petroleum prices expanded, core inflation which excludes food and energy rose by 2.2 percent and recently international oil prices have been declining due to delays in expected u.s interest rate cuts and lower than expected summer demand and the average price of dubai crude last month was 84 per uh, 84 dollars per barrel down from 89.2 dollars per barrel in the previous month now the government assesses that the global economy is recovering at different speeds across regions and continues to face uncertainties such as geopolitical risks from the Russia-Ukraine war, instability in the Middle East, and strengthened trade regulations among major countries. The Ministry of Economy and Finance stated that our top priority is to stabilize people's livelihoods through tangible recovery such as rapid establishment of a stable inflation trend and increasing domestic demand. And they also added that we will also thoroughly manage potential risks and uh, strive to enhance the dynamism of our economy. Uh, we are heavily dependent on our benchmark crude is the Dubai crude. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has gone down to $81.60 now uh, is the current price. Uh, the West Texas Intermediate is currently at $78.26. Um, some of you guys might be saying, well, if the West Texas Intermediate, which is uh, the U.S. crude, is cheaper, why not get uh, the, the West Texas Intermediate? Uh, that's because of the shipping prices. You have to also consider that uh, Middle East is a lot closer uh, than the United States. And if you want to buy West Texas Intermediate, which you can, uh, you're going to put in the, the shipping charges. It's probably going to be more expensive uh, than the, the Dubai crude here. And it's unfortunate because it's closer and probably the Middle East has way more uh, oil than the United States. But they know this. Uh, their, their proximity is pretty good. And uh, because there is more demand for this, uh, they're going to be inc- it's a higher price than the West Texas Intermediate. Uh, we have some data from uh, the central bank on uh, Friday, which showed that South Korea's import prices ended their four-month gain in the month of May. Uh, this due to the fall in oil prices, as we mentioned, and also the Korean ones rise against the greenback. So, Seon, let's get more on this. Sure. According to the Bank of Korea's data on May's import and export price, uh, the import price index declined 1.4% last month uh, from a month earlier, uh, following a 3.8% on-month gain of the previous month. And the data showed that from a year earlier, import prices also rose uh, 4.6% last month, following a 2.9% on-year advance of the previous month. And import prices are a major factor that determines the path of the country's overall rate of inflation. And the Dubai crude price, uh, South Korea's benchmark, stood at uh, the 84.04 US dollars per barrel in May, down from 89.17 dollars um, from the previous month. And the Korean won averaged 1,365.39 against the greenback last month, up 0.2 percent from the previous month. And the import prices of raw materials fell 3.7% on month last month, while those for intermediate goods slipped 0.3% over the cited period. 
And meanwhile, the export price index also fell 0.4% in May after a 4.4% on month gain、um, in the previous month. And the country's consumer prices, a key gauge of inflation, rose 2.7% on year last month compared with、uh, the 2.9% on year rise a month earlier. And this marked the second straight month that the price growth slowed down and、uh, the figure stayed below 3%. It's kind of curious because, I mean, a lot of this、uh, relies heavily on the, the crude prices. And again,、uh, being that South Korea's、uh, benchmark is the Dubai crude, I was looking at、uh, one year figures, and the one year low was at、uh, $72.46 a,、uh, a barrel.、Uh, the one year high was actually September of last year at $94.99, so almost $95 a barrel. But、uh, we look at the recent numbers here. It's、uh, gone down quite a bit.、Uh, at、uh, June 4th, it was $78.46. So it's going down quite a bit. But if you go back, go back five years, Uh, well, actually, we can't look at the pandemic numbers because that was like historic low numbers.、Uh, if you look at the previous lows, it usually lingers around、uh, the $70 mark,、uh, is what it is. And then it would kind of go down. $30 was, I think, the previous low. If we cancel out the,、uh, the, the pandemic numbers, but it's gone up a lot, is what we're trying to say here. And it seems like with、uh, the OPEC plus countries、uh, continuing. To cut its productions、uh, going into the first half of next year, it seems like the prices are going to hover around, the、uh, around this area right now.、Uh, let's move on here, talk about、uh, some stock news here.、Uh, it's been for years now、uh, that the South Korean government has banned any kind of、uh, short selling, but they have announced that they're going to finally resume short selling on March for,、uh, 31st next year、uh, after establishing an online computing system for short selling.、Mm -hmm. Hannah, let's get more on this. Sure. Now, the government extended the full ban on short selling, which was initially until the end of this month to March 30th next year. The Financial Services Commission, or FSC, announced at a briefing held at the government complex Seoul on Thursday and said that the FSC will resume short selling once a System to prevent illegal sh、uh, short selling is established next year, adding that it is believed that short selling can be resumed from March 31st, 2025. Now, the FSC explained that on November 5th last year, in light of increasing market uncertainties and the severe situation where illegal short selling had become customary, hindering fair price formation in the stock market and undermining market confidence, it had decided to extend the short selling ban until the first half of this. Year. The government and related agencies expanded their investigation into short selling practices and discovered suspicions of illegal short selling amounting to 211.2 billion won that occurred before the ban was implemented. The Financial Supervisory Service, or FSS, and the Korea Exchange plan to establish an electronic system to prevent illegal short selling by the end of March next year. The FSS will provide guidelines and support. To ensure that internal balance management systems within institutions are prepared within this year, the Korea Exchange will establish a central short selling inspection system by the end of March next year. And the FSC announced that if short selling is resumed without a system in place, there is a risk of repeated large scale illegal short selling. Added that the FSC decided to extend the short selling ban from July 1st, 2024 to March 30th, 2025, to alleviate concerns. Concerns about hindering fair price formation by establishing the electronic system for short selling. What's interesting is、uh, if you look up why short selling is illegal in some countries,、uh, they say bans on short selling are frequently done to curb market manipulation, as、uh, you know, Hannah kind of mentioned、mm -hmm. here.、Uh, the people that were very much against the idea that South Korea was banning short selling were foreign investors. Now, if you look at、uh, the, the market, South Korean market, the vast majority of the investment. Is done by foreign investors. They're the ones with the big money here. And they're the ones that make the huge differences in the short selling. They're able to manipulate this. And so, in order to kind of stop this from happening, and we did see quite a bit of volatility. If you remember when short selling was banned, it was during the, 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 at the peak of,、uh, at the start of the pandemic when the stock prices were just getting ridiculous. And、uh, now that things have settled down, I think、uh, now they're going to be uh, uh, unbanning it、uh, starting next year. 
Let's move on. Uh, I don't know how this is going to pan out uh, moving forward here, but the United States and Ukraine, after months of negotiations, uh, have finally signed, signed a bilateral security pact on the sidelines of the G7 summit over in Italy on Thursday local time. Now, this uh, agreement lays out a path for the U.S.'s long-term security relationship with Kyiv. Uh, so, you know, let's get more on this. Sure. So, President Joe Biden and Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky signed a security agreement on the sidelines of the G7 and held a joint press conference. And the agreement commits the U.S. for 10 years to continue the training of Ukraine's armed forces and more cooperation in the production of weapons and military equipment. And in the joint news conference, Biden reiterated the U.S. support of Ukraine and said that the U.S. will ensure Ukraine can defend itself now and deter potential attacks in the future. And he said that the U.S. air defense system support will continue to focus on Ukraine and that other countries expecting that same support will have to wait. And Zelensky marked what he called a truly historic day after signing the agreement and said it would benefit all countries because Russia is a real global threat. And the Ukrainian president said the pact will serve as a bridge to Kiev's attempt to join NATO. Though the agreement is not binding to future president, Zelensky said he thinks future U.S. leaders will continue to support Ukraine. And he also said he received assurances from Chinese leadership that they will not supply weapons to Russia. And meanwhile, all the G7 leaders reached an agreement to loan money to Ukraine backed by 50 billion, billion US dollars of profits from frozen Russian investments, which Joe Biden called a significant achievement. Yeah, there's something like $300 billion of uh, frozen uh, Russian assets and the, the interest out of that, uh, the windfall profits coming out to $50 billion. Um, but also, NATO seeking to agree on providing an annual 40 billion euros uh, in assistance to Ukraine. Uh, this was uh, this is going to probably happen in the NATO summit that's going to take place in Washington next month. Hannah, let's get mm -hmm. more on this. Sure. Now, on the first day of the NATO defense minister's meeting held in Brussels on Thursday local time, NATO Security General Stoltenberg said since Russia's full-scale invasion in 2022, NATO allies have provided Ukraine with military support worth approximately 40 billion euros annually, and that he proposes that the member states should at least maintain this level of support and that allies should share this burden equally. He also emphasized that an increased role for NATO in supporting Ukraine will provide predictability and address both immediate needs and long-term demands. If an agreement is reached, it is expected that NATO member countries will each contribute a certain amount based on their GDP, collectively raising more than 40 billion euros in support. However, there are concerns about the effectiveness of this guideline as the NATO defense spending guideline agreed at a minimum of 2% of GDP is also not being strictly followed. Hungary, which opposes military support for Ukraine, has decided early on to opt out of this plan. The prime minister stated that the previous day stated the previous day that Hungary would neither participate in or nor oppose any NATO-led plans related to supporting Ukraine, a position accepted by Stoltenberg. NATO defense ministers also discussed NATO-led security support and military training plans for Ukraine on that day, and Stoltenberg said on the second day of the meeting that uh, is today that defense ministers are expected to agree on NATO-led security support and training plans for Ukraine. Now, this this move is interpreted as preparing for the potential weakening of U.S.-centered support for Ukraine if Donald Trump is re-elected as president of the U.S. in November this year. Oh, by the way, that uh, the U.S.-Ukraine security pact, they're saying that probably Trump, if he does come into office, they're probably, he's probably going to scrap that mm -hmm. anyways. Uh, he said that he's going to end the war in Ukraine in a, in a day if mm -hmm. he becomes president. We'll see if that happens. But uh, apart from that, NATO ministers agreed on the first NATO-Ukraine Innovation and Cooperation Roadmap. Uh, this is a plan considered mm -hmm. a stepping stone towards Ukraine's NATO membership, which Russia is 
really not going to be happy mm -hmm. with this. It, actually, the whole conflict right now is over the idea that Ukraine wants to join uh, NATO membership. So tell us more about mm -hmm. this. Right. Now, this plan aims to promote NATO standardization in Ukraine's defense sector. And in the same context, NATO announced that it would soon approve the establishment of a NATO-Ukraine joint analysis, training and education center in Poland, a NATO member and Ukraine's neighboring country. Now, while there has been some progress on long-term support support methods at this meeting, there were no announcements regarding additional support for air defense systems, such as the Patriot urgently requested by Ukraine. Ukraine had requested at least seven more Patriot batteries to intercept Russian missiles in April, and subsequently Germany decided to provide one Patriot battery. And apart from this, the Netherlands agreed to provide some components of the Patriot system. And it appears that the U.S., which has the most Patriot systems, has not reached a clear conclusion. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin stated that efforts are ongoing for additional air defense system support, but had no new announcements at the time. And on Friday local time, discussions are set to take place on expanding defense industry production within NATO allies. And the agenda also includes strengthening cooperation with Asia-Pacific partner countries, including South Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, who were also invited to the summit. Stoltenberg expressed strong concern over reports of an imminent visit by Russian president to North Korea, stating that close cooperation with Asia-Pacific partners has become even more crucial now. I'd be very surprised if Ukraine's able to join uh, NATO. But um, let's move on here. Russia's defense ministry reporting on Thursday that Russia and Belarus uh, be continue their uh, joint readiness for uh, Belarusian combat and Russian nuclear forces during the second stage of their joint tactical nuclear weapons drill. Uh, the military drills coincides again with the start of the G7 summit over in Italy. So see on round the cell. Let's get more on this. Sure. So according to TASS Russian news agency, Russia's defense ministry said in the statement that the presence of the Russian Federation and the Republic of Belarus made a decision on the second stage of the non-strategic nuclear forces drills. And the ministry stated that this exercise practiced in the particular jointly reading Belarusian combat employment and the Russian nuclear provision units. And it also noted that in fulfilling their objectives, mobile formations of the Russian Defense Ministry's 12th Main Department delivered practice nuclear munitions to field storage sites of a missile a brigade positioning area and an attack aircraft operational airfield. And the Russia's Defense Ministry reported earlier that pursuant to an instruction by President Vladimir Putin and for the purpose of raising the preparedness of the non-strategic nuclear forces for combat objectives, uh, the general staff had launched preparations for drills in the immediate future with missile formations of the so uh, Southern Military District with the involvement of aircraft and naval forces. That's right. And uh, for our listeners out there, there is going to be more, I guess, a conflict, it seems like, uh, in Ukraine, because if there is more news that uh, Ukraine is continuing to push for NATO membership, and if there's any signs that NATO may uh, hand over membership uh, of its uh, security alliance, so Russia is just going to continue to expand uh, their uh, invasion to other territories, it seems like what it is. And, uh, you know, time seems like on, is on Russia's hand. Uh, how much more support can Ukraine get? Uh, we'll have to see. But nevertheless, guys, thank you very much for your report. Have a safe weekend. We'll see you guys again. Thank, thank you. you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.